Okay, this is round two um, in the last lecture, which, uh, what week is it? It would be week 10, I guess. <clears throat> we were talking about how America had certain ideals and started to build a country. Um, I didn't explain uh, about the 13 colonies, so I'll start with that. That's the name of the lecture for today, and that's what I'll start with as we continue our way through chapter four. Uh, again, this is not something that you can read about in the textbook, just something that I, uh, it has to be explained. So make sure that you pay attention to this lecture and write down some notes because some of these things are in the textbook and some of them are not. Uh, the details about the 13 colonies are, are not. It's another thing that needs to be added, I think. Um, each, thir each of these colonies <clears throat> had a sort of different character and a different reason for existing. Uh, I'm not going to make a list of them. It's hard enough for me to remember, so I, I don't think I'm going to make, make you or force you to memorize them. Just you need to know there's 13. Uh, to name a few of the famous ones, North and South Carolina, Georgia, New York, uh, Delaware, Maryland, Rhode Island, Pennsylvania. Um, th that's just to name a few. The reason that it's important to know that there's 13 is because we, I think we think about America right now. If I say America, you think it's a gigantic place. Uh, and you have to remember that the, some of the smallest states uh, like Delaware or Rhode Island, I think Rhode Island is the smallest state, um, that they were important in creating the country, but the country didn't exist. It was just sort of uh, 13 different uh, interconnected landing points for immigration to the United States. One of the things that was a big problem, obviously, was the fact that there's already people there. Uh, native people had been living there for thousands of years and um, they occupied the land that the settlers and the colonists wanted to build on. Um, the main reason, uh, obviously the Europeans had a technological advantage having gunpowder and steel and ships and glass making and um, they also had horses, they had domesticated animals. Um, one of the references for this book is uh, in the back that you can find, uh, Jared's, Jared Diamond writes, uh, wrote a book. Let me see if I can find it here. Guns, Germs, and Steel. Yeah, so at the back of the book, there's a whole bunch of references. So it's not like I'm getting these ideas out of thin air. Uh, like I said earlier in the last lecture, there's a lot of professors and researchers and historians and cultural theorists and English English majors who have contributed to what is in my book. So guns, germs, and steel is what Jared Diamond calls the sort of the, the combination of factors that makes it, you know, gives the advantage to certain groups of people. The Europeans had guns. They had steel and they had these diseases they were carrying with them and it would kill of some of the Europeans, but it killed a lot of native people. Some, some uh, anthropologists say over 90%, you know, so it would be like, uh, it would be like people from India. I think we have some people from Bangladesh. Uh, in the classroom. It would be like some people in India arrived um, in Europe, in England, right after the Black Death, except worse, right? So right at, during the Black Death, after the Black Death, the, the states, uh, the kingdoms of Europe were decimated. Um, they lacked manpower, they, they had political unrest and social unrest and were disorganized and unprepared. Um, so this is uh, 
probably the worst disaster in human history. Um, it's a catastrophe on a on a global scale that that exceeds anything coronavirus um, suggests, or even the Black Death. You know. Um, if 90% of the people died in North and South America in the population, we'll say a low number. Some people say it was almost 100 million, but we'll just say a lower number like 50 million. If 95% of the people or 90% of the people died, you're talking about over 40 million people dying. We're, as a percentage of the global population, that's a bigger number uh, than any other disaster. So <clears throat> that is... Uh, that is a, a fact, and um, it was it wasn't a malicious intent in the beginning, um, but certainly there there wasn't really anything that could be done once the disease was introduced to the native people. It just spread, and it, it, it they had no a means for treatment, and their immune systems were not primed to defend against the, these diseases that come from really disgusting conditions in cities, mostly, um, and with cohabitation with animals. We've, we know now that lots of diseases come out of Asia um, through, because the, the animals are in close proximity to the human beings. We didn't live with animals like that, and sometimes diseases jump from animals to human beings. So that's one possibility. Of course, there's rare diseases in the jungle, which if you go into the jungle and you catch it and you bring it back, um, for example, you can spread it through a population and there's really, um, people's immune systems are cannot defend against that kind of disease because it was deep in the rainforest for hundreds of years and people are not exposed to it. So this is what happens. And as a consequence, there isn't, there is, there are some conflicts. There's many, many battles and wars between native people and the Europeans, but the, the, the Europeans have a huge advantage in that their populations support, you know, continuous growth through immigration and the, the, um, the native populations have collapsed essentially. Um, so that there's, you know, if you, in Europe, like I said about the Black Death, the Black Death has caused some places to be abandoned. Some towns just disappeared or the farmland just didn't get used so that the trees started growing back and the, um, the you know, forest started to expand and uh, those open fields that were used for cultivation were gone. The same thing started to happen. Uh, with the native people, they, if you, they had a hundred villages in their tribe, uh, and ninety percent of the people died, then most of those villages would just disappear. Um, Vancouver is a Canadian city, and when the the person who discovered it, um, I'm not sure what his title was. I guess it's a captain or or admiral, Vancouver. Uh, but if I remember correctly. I'm not going to guess at his first name. We'll just call him um, Captain Vancouver. He sailed around and discovered the bay where Vancouver is located, English Bay, uh, in the mountains. It's a beautiful location, and there was already settlements there, but there was no people. It was just sort of uh, buildings, um, huts and tents and cabins falling down, and um, you could see that there was a lot of people that had lived in that area, but they were all gone. And that's because the the, the disease traveled um, ahead of the Europeans and sort of um, attacked all the native people and made it so that colonization could move quickly. Um, because even if they did resist, they if they somehow um, won a victory, which they, they did on occasion, win battles, um, the, the combination of lack of numbers and technology and, and, and uh, organization between their tribes. I mean, they, the English people, as much as any other 
a European people, the Spanish, they, they used to make friends with some tribes and then fight against the other tribes. But after, you know, the enemy tribes were eliminated, the friendly allies discovered that the English or the Spanish or the, or the French or, or the Dutch or whoever it is, um, became their sort of masters and, and uh, forced them to sign treaties that they didn't want to and move out of locations where they wanted to stay. And that wasn't part of the deal. So there's a lot of, there is a lot of bad history. We'll talk about that again later because we've got to talk about the 13 colonies first. And um, the, the real, most of the, the uh, most important conflicts, I would say, uh, with the native peoples that happened later, not during uh, the 13 colonies period. One of the reasons is <clears throat> that um, they were not in direct contact with many of the major tribes in the center of the United States yet, um, because they were all, all these colonies were near the water because they needed to, um, sand did receive uh, ships and the whole Excuse me. Uh, the whole um, reason for some of the uh, colony's existence was trade. So, the Virginia colony, the Virginia colony is the first one and the biggest one. I believe I mentioned this, or at least it's in the textbook. Um, the the city, the town's name was Jamestown after King James, and the colony was called Virginia because it was the Virginia company um, that founded it and created it in order to make money and it was named after Queen Elizabeth, the so-called Virgin Queen. Now um, Virginia, they like I said, they were trying to find gold and they were trying to um, find valuable things but they didn't find anything uh, on the land in Virginia but they discovered that they could plant tobacco and tobacco would make them uh, rich because there wasn't, it was sort of like a trendy luxury in Europe, which is which was in high demand um, when Virginia started its tobacco farms. So um, that's how the colony grew, is that people who grew this crop, tobacco crop, in order to sell it for smoking, for cigarettes and cigars, um, they, they became rich and so a lot of I mean a lot of people came to Virginia and worked on those plantations because in the beginning there wasn't uh, slavery on a in any systemic or or large you know ca um, capacity the, the Spanish and the Portuguese were the ones that uh, had um, slaves earlier and and had created a system to buy and sell um, humans who were transported from Africa um, to do work in their their respective empires. England started to do this too and um, started later than them but their their slavery society started to accelerate um, in size once the tobacco um, was once they were producing too much tobacco, and um, Virginia was basically its population. The amount of good land for writing uh, for for planting tobacco was taken up. Um, they had to do something. They had to start doing something different, and they had to start living in different p places. So, Virginia, um, because of this attitude of the United Kingdom, like from James all the way to King George II and King George III, uh, hun several hundred years later, it's about 150 years there where the colonies are essentially on their own, doing their own thing. And it's to control them or tax them or regulate or to fund buildings or expansion and other things. Uh, is not attractive to the British government. The King of England is always having money problems, as we've discussed, and there's no interest in um, 
spending more money on taking care of these um, colonies on the, you know, on the eastern seaboard, on the edge of the American continent. So what basically happens is they, they start to form their own um, sort of unofficial, I suppose you might say, uh, group government, you know, management, you know, teams. And it's, a, it's basically the wealthy people gather together and then they make decisions as a group in sort of ad hoc democracy system. And that, that starts to happen in Virginia and um, that, because they need to make laws. They need to settle disputes between people who argue if somebody steals your pig or somebody attacks your family or something like that. They need courts, they need laws, need some structure, um, which it's, it's expensive to um, create that kind of thing and to pay for it. And uh, the kings and queens of England don't have enough money, quite frankly. They probably would prefer to be managing uh, the colonies closer, but they don't have any money to do it. So they don't. And that's called benign neglect. Uh, benign meaning like sort of um, friendly or positive. And neglect meaning not doing anything. So it's, it's a nice sort of nice... Um, ignoring somebody in a nice way. I suppose is the way I would um, say it. Uh, but this all comes to an end uh, when they start fighting against France in the Seven Years' War. In England, we talked about the Hundred Years' War. There's France and England have fought many times and it becomes the United Kingdom. Um, by this time, it's the, the United Kingdom fighting France, not England by itself. So. Now they can actually, um, I guess, sustain uh, a war with France, even though France has a bigger population and has sort of a more strict control of its people uh, because of England's financial and, and uh, trade empire that's been growing uh, ever since they started the colony in Virginia, um, the, the wealth, and the sea power of the British give them an advantage that the French, the French can't overcome. Napoleon can't overcome that either. Um, so they fight this war, Seven Years War. They fight it in Asia. They fight it in Africa. They fight in the Caribbean, on the ocean. Um, they fight in America. And of course, they fight in Europe. Um, and it's mainly between the United Kingdom and France and, and their allies. So in North America, it's the Iroquois and the British. So don't forget that name because it'll come up later, but that's on a future, that's in a future lecture when you talk about natives in more detail. But the Iroquois um, Confederation, group of tribes, uh, including the Mohicans and the Mohawk, I think they're the most famous ones. Um, those tribes take, are on the Brit help the British fight and the Algonquin tribes of which there are many different um, members but the Algonquin is sort of like a, lang a language group where um, they can sort of communicate with each other and they have similar cultures. The Algonquin are more peaceful than the Iroquois uh, and they um, trade and and cooperate with the French. So it's the French and the Algonquins against the Iroquois and the British and they fight for more than seven years. I don't know if you noticed that. I have to double check the dates. I think that's right though. It's almost nine years, but there's also a nine years war. They're not using, they're not being very creative with their names. So this is called the seven years, even, even though it looks to me like it's eight and a half years long. It's called the seven years war. Maybe that's because at the end they stopped fighting and they were just waiting to figure out uh, how to finish it. And they had to sign a treaty called the Treaty of Paris that ended the fighting. The important thing about, the most important thing about that, especially because of me um, being Canadian, uh, from my perspective, the most important thing that happened was New France, um, which became Quebec uh, and New Brunswick, two provinces in Canada, uh, they uh, were given up. They were they were 
as a result of France losing the war. In the treaty, they gave up um, control of their colony in North America. They retained their colony in Haiti. That seems like a, maybe nowadays because of the resources and the population and the the condition of different regions, you might say, why would you why would you take Haiti over Quebec? The the land area is extremely different. But um, at the time, the most important thing for France was uh, money, and um, Haiti was famous for sugar, for producing sugar. And there was a reason why uh, this was called white gold. This is called white gold by a lot of people. It's, it's, it was his nickname because that's how valuable sugar was at the beginning. Um, so if you, for the French, having the sugar plantations in Haiti uh, was much more valuable than keeping control of Quebec City and Montreal and St. Lawrence River. And uh, they used primarily their, their, their most valuable um, commodity was furs, but that fur market had gradually, the value of furs had gradually eroded and gone down, whereas the price of sugar was still very high. Um, so they chose to give up New France, which would become Quebec in Canada, and keep their Caribbean territory. Um, so there you can see 1763, we're talking about the 18th century now, um, moving forward. Uh, there's 20 years exactly between the end of the Seven Years' War and the end of the Revolutionary War, the American Revolutionary War, which these guys participated in, George Washington as a general and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin as politicians. Um, that means that the British were in complete control of North America, except for Mexico and Florida and um, the Louisiana Territory um, for only 20 years. And then they had to, to give it up to this new country that declared itself the United States of America. Uh, one of the reasons that the war happened, there are many reasons, but I'm going to suggest several of them to you and I want you to think about them. Um, the first one is some is a familiar theme, is that people don't like taxes and especially they don't like taxes suddenly appearing where there wasn't very many before. You remember we were talking about the financial issues uh, that Queen Elizabeth and King James and King Charles the first and then King Charles the second and James the second and then William the third all those people in the in the 17th century had to deal with these things because Henry the eighth spent all the money and sold all of his property and he wasn't independently wealthy the only way he could get money was through tax but um, as a especially as a queen for Queen Elizabeth or as a king that came from Scotland King James uh, or Charles I who was too stubborn to accept any sort of reform to the monarchy, to the system of government that they were using, um, in all those cases, they were always short of money and raising taxes would be incredibly unpopular, even if it was a small amount. Now, the, the, it has to be noted that the American people were some of the um, lowest, least, ta they were the, some of the least taxed people in the world. Um, but obviously they liked that. And that was part of the benign neglect, right? You develop the colonies, you set up your system of government and you manage your, your colony yourself and you, you collect money and, and invest privately and the government's not going to do anything. After the war though, and the, the war was incredibly expensive, it basically broke France. Um, that war shattered their financial stability and as a consequence they would have the French Revolution um, in 1789 which comes only six years after the end of the American Revolutionary War it's because of France uh, expands itself sort of economically and financially in the Seven Years War and then they help the Americans 
um, fight against the British because the British are the traditional enemy and it's to their advantage to do that. So they do, but the financial pressure of, of those multiple, they fight the, the English over and over again over the centuries and um, it's too much. It's too much for the people to, to support. And so the French Revolution will sort of be an explosion of that um, seven, hundreds of years of sort of um, pressure, uh, financial pressure on the peasants and the regular people of France. So the Americans have the same opinion <clears throat> as the French do, but the French are very, very heavily taxed and the Americans are not. So what's happened is British are just saying, okay, you got to pay, you know, 3% on your sugar, or you got to buy the tea from us, or um, you need to put a stamp on each official document that you, you make in the government. You have to put a stamp on it. It's called the Stamp Act, and it's a stamp tax. Um, people hated these things. And what's more is that they said, okay, if you're going to tax us, then we have to be able to participate in the government. Um, no taxation without representation. You can tax us, but if you do, then we need to send people to the parliament building in the United Kingdom, and they need to um, be able to give, our, our, give us a political voice. Remember, one of the American ideals is popular government. <clears throat> which means some kind of republic or democracy where you have an opportunity to um, voice your opinions politically um, through a representative um, to, to a, um, the central government. Uh, but the, the British imperial system doesn't allow for this. Um, colon colonies are managed from England, not um, the colonies don't get to decide you know, what happens in London or England, they, they are um, supposed to be beneath the metropole, um, the, the center, you know, um, political and, and economic, military, um, social power. <clears throat> the English themselves, the, the, people, the British, are paying much higher taxes. And they're not really happy about paying taxes for armies to fight in North America either. So you've got the Americans who are British colonists, they're not Americans yet, they're upset about being overtaxed. And meanwhile, on the other side of the ocean, the people who are paying for the war, um, once the war starts, they, the, once the protesting turns into rebellion and the rebellion turns into violence and the violence turns into organized war, step by step, this is how you get to a revolution Remember that the peasants' revolt is, is like an incomplete revolution. And, and uh, sometimes a protest, you know, is the beginning of a revolution. Usually not, but like it escalates. So it, it takes 15 years <clears throat> almost um, from the end of the, the Seven Years' War for the revolution to fully manifest itself as a, as a revolution. One of the things that... Um, no taxation with representation without representation is one of the slogans that they use, and common sense is a is a pamphlet, and so it's like a really short book um, that Thomas Paine writes, uh, and that's not in the textbook. So remember, this is Thomas Paine, but as I said, I'm not concerned about you remembering the person's name. I'll usually give that to you in a question. Um, what did What did Thomas Paine write though? Uh, he wrote a pamphlet called Common Sense, which there's been arguments about how important it is and how many people read it, but suffice to say, a lot of people read it. Um, literacy was not at 99.9% .9 in America like it is now, so not everybody could read, but suffice to say that most people heard about it, the message of it, or read it, or had somebody tell them about it. Um, so it was very, very popular. And common sense just means it, it's common sense. We're, we're living in um, these, these colonies who are being controlled by this island very far away that doesn't understand how we live. And we're going to develop into a more powerful country anyway. Benjamin Franklin agreed with Thomas Paine on that point is that eventually 
um, America was going to have to be independent because it's, it was going to overtake uh, the United Kingdom as a, as a larger, more influential, more powerful country. And it shouldn't be ruled by a faraway nation island. So um, Benjamin Franklin, though, is going to change his mind very quickly when he becomes a, a delegate who goes to England and meets the, all of the MPs and um, the Prime Minister, all the ministers of the English government, he goes to Parliament and to explain what's going on with the protests against the taxes and the violence and um, what the problem is. And, and he goes into the room sort of amazed at all these things he's seeing that he's heard about and all these famous people that he gets to talk to. And um, he's Benjamin Franklin's a very, he's probably the most respected British colonist, but everybody still looks down on him as a lesser British citizen because just because he lives uh, in North America and he's not um, a Londoner or uh, an English, he, he isn't an Englishman, um, he's, he's a colonist. <clears throat> so they don't even let him speak, <clears throat> they just pretty much sit him down in front of everybody and just criticize him and insult him and yell him and yell at him and chastise him for not, not being a good British citizen uh, for who knows, and I guess a, a couple hours. He just, Benjamin Franklin was smart enough just to sit there and just listen to this overreaction and then leave. But you can't really do that um, and expect a person to believe in your government's ability to compromise or to come up with a solution. So Benjamin Franklin went back to America thinking, no, we don't need, it's not going to be good enough to be independent 100 years from now. Once America becomes stronger, we, we've got to do it now because there's no respect. There's no consideration of the, the reasoning or the, 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 the condition of the, the colonists in America by the imperial government. They sort of ignore everything. They didn't even listen to what he said. They just yell at him and then he just goes back. So he becomes, then he becomes the, he becomes a diplomatic representative in France um, because Benjamin Franklin is a genius. So of course he can speak French. Uh, he dresses up with a raccoon skin hat and, and puts on his buckskin and stuff and dresses like he's a frontier, you know, settler, pioneer type person uh, and walks around Paris, you know, speaking perfect French to everyone. And the, the French pretty much fall in love with this, you know, um, elderly, frontier, French speaking American who is asking them for something that they, they want to do anyway. Right, he he's, he wants support from France militarily, especially he wants money and equipment. But if they come with their mili with their army and their um, navy, their ships, even better. Um, and eventually, you know, he persuades them. Not eventually, fairly fairly quickly, he persuades them. But <clears throat> it, it takes George Washington actually stopping the British uh, in North America several times before they actually going to start supporting the war um, effectively. You have to read about these people. They're, these three people are in the book. Um, you have to talk about, you, you have to read that over. Um, I'm not gonna explain every detail. Um, <clears throat> but Benjamin Franklin is a, he's a multi-talented genius. Um, he's, and he's older. George Washington is sort of in between Thomas Jefferson, and, but Benjamin Franklin is sometimes called the grandfather of America because most of the the revolutionaries were younger um, but he was of a previous generation uh, but he added a lot of prestige he added a lot of respect and and um, a lot of British colonists saw that Benjamin Franklin was in favor of independence and and so they thought well Benjamin Franklin is our best citizen and that's what he wants so that's what I should want too so it was a huge mistake by the British government to treat him like that. 
uh, because losing Benjamin Franklin's support sort of just pushed everything, uh, accelerated everything. Um, because once Benjamin Franklin was supporting uh, a movement for independence, then a lot of people were um, persuaded um, by his his opinion and his um, participation. So you, they ended up drafting a declaration of independence. We'll talk about this in class, specifically what it says. But they declare independence first. Um, we'll talk about the exact wording of it. It's a very interesting document. The person who writes it is Thomas Jefferson. Um, we're going to talk about in this course, in the next few weeks, we're going to talk about native people and we're going to talk about um, slavery, right? And this is a huge issue, is that in the Declaration of Independence, it says all men are created equal, except men who are not rich and white, right? Even, even in America, when they start voting, there's a, there's a property requirement. So you have to actually be a wealthy white man in order to cast a vote. Uh, so it's a, that's very restrictive. It's um, not, it doesn't fit the ideal at all. It, it's a huge contradiction that we're creating a place that's separating from the British Empire where there is classes and when, where there is a distinction between membership of your class and where you live and what race you belong to. All these things are, your status um, depends on these things. Uh, whether you're a woman or not, women are not included. Um, that's a problem too. At, in the Declaration of in Independence, it's supposed to make everyone equal, but it doesn't do that at all. Um, it fails completely, <laughs> but it's, it is a document like the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta was a failure too. Remember, I, I told you 1215, the Magna Carta was a, a document that it, the king signed, even though he didn't want to. And then he rejected all of the things he agreed to and continued to rule after that um, without following the Magna Carta. However, hundreds of years later, the Magna Carta's ideals were realized um, and, and their, their intent went beyond uh, what was actually in the document. So the same thing happens with the Declaration of Independence. It's a sort of a... It's a draft. Benjamin Franklin changes a lot of it. Thomas Jefferson doesn't like that, doesn't like people changing his writing. Um, he's trained as a lawyer and he's younger and he's, all these guys are, Benjamin Franklin's not that tall, but Thomas Jefferson is sort of like an Abraham Lincoln type person. He's, he was really tall. So uh, in an era where if you're not 190 centimeters, you're a giant, right? There's no NBA basketball players walking around yet. So like when he walked, Abraham Lincoln as well, especially with his big hat on, and when he walked down the street, you could see him uh, being almost like a head taller than everybody else. One of the contradictions, you know, individually, Thomas Jefferson wrote this document and he's a slave owner. Um, a lot of people don't realize that, but when I first started studying American culture and American history in more detail in preparation to teach this course, uh, I didn't realize that so many of the American founding fathers were slave owners. <clears throat> but it's partly because in Virginia, they used slaves um, because of tobacco. And then later in South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia, uh, the only way to to keep up with the demand and, the, and to increase your production, um, not the only way. The, the, it turned out to be one of the um, most advantageous ways was to purchase people to do the work um, rather than pay somebody or, or indenture somebody for five or 10 years to work on your, your land but to permanently um, put them to work. It was partly because of um, the climate and the disease and the resistance and the, the strength of the African people, I suppose. Like, I mean, physically and mentally being able to endure um, that kind of hard work. Sugar, I've never done it, but cultivating sugar is a very labor intensive and sort of dangerous occupation that's 
you have to heat up the sugar and boil it and it, it's there's there's you have to use sharp tools to to harvest it and everything it's very hard work apparently um and most people were not interested in doing that unless they were paid very well so um so uh, purchasing a person having a slave do the work for their entire life at one price was like sort of a, a long-term investment and George Washington will free his slaves when he dies, but he will use his slaves to become very wealthy before that. Um, his wife also um, was a plantation owner and who had even more slaves than him. So George Washington sometimes gets painted as this <clears throat> rosy, you know, um, perfect, ideal American defender of freedom and independence. Uh, George Washington never told a lie, <clears throat> that kind of stuff. He didn't, he, it's true he didn't like to say bad words. He didn't like to swear, but he certainly lied enough times. Uh, you can't be a politician and not lie. But the, he sort of became a symbol of the perfect American leader, almost you know the same way King Arthur or Alfred the Great or Sejong uh, became you know emblematic of sort of Korean virtues or British virtues, and you, the, depending on what country you, are, you live in and what you come, where you come from, um, some people have a more positive view of certain historical figures. Uh, but certainly, George Washington has been sort of scrubbed clean, and you can't really say anything bad about him, even though I just did. Um, he's not a, a pathological liar. He doesn't usually lie, but of course. George Washington never told a lie is a perfect example of not rep, not saying the truth. He, he did lie sometimes. He's not a perfect person and he did own slaves. And um, so the Declaration of the Independence and the Constitution that is written uh, at the end to form the country uh, you know, officially, um, which George Washington will become the first uh, president and then he will do another term. Uh, two terms as president of the United States, that those documents um, have this fatal contradiction in it where uh, many people are not included in this idea of equality. And this will end up eventually causing the American Civil War about 75 years later. Thomas Jefferson <clears throat> actually uh, had a wife and she died and promised her that he wouldn't marry again, so he didn't, but then he um, took a sort of mistress uh, at, who was one of his slaves and then had a relationship with her, and she had multiple children, um, and supposedly she was only maybe a, a quarter um, African, and so his children and her together, having children would mean that they're children were like one eighth uh, African American, but because of the rules and the laws of the new Republic that Thomas Jefferson helped create, his children were also slaves and he never really did anything about that. And their children would be slaves and so on. So Thomas Jefferson also, just a little bit of a contradiction there saying people are all created equal and then you know having a relationship and not marrying somebody and then you know not taking care of uh, the children that they bore together um, it's a pretty shocking behavior if you're supposed to be the person who is um, espousing these virtues right of equality um, I think for today that's enough. Um, it's almost 45 minutes, but this is to replace a, a Friday lecture. So it's going to be longer than usual, um, longer than the Wednesday ones normally are. Um, just to come back to, again, this idea of diversity, um, the 13 colonies uh, all have their own character. Like I said, Rhode Island is really small. Massachusetts is a Puritan especially in terms of religion, um, America ends up being incredibly diverse. Um, 
most people are Christian. Some people are Jewish. Um, then in the future, there's going to be more people from other religions. But just in terms of what happens in Europe, when Protestants and Catholics, you know, get together, they fight and they kill each other. But somehow they, they coexist. And Maryland is Catholic. And New York is cosmopolitan and trade-oriented because it was originally a Dutch colony called New Amsterdam. And then it was renamed New York. Um, South Carolina and North Carolina... They use John Locke's ideas to try and create a government system, which doesn't work um, effectively, but they are experimental republics. Uh, Virginia uses its wealthy merchants and upper class aristocrats to form a, a sort of council of burgesses um, to make their decisions. And uh, all of these systems started to come into existence. Georgia actually has no slaves at first, and, and tries to uh, have a, create a colony named after King George, um, that's why it's Georgia, uh, that, that um, tries to approach these ideals of like the rights of human beings and equality and classless society. But they, they find that, the landowners find that they can't compete uh, with Virginia and North and South Carolina who are using slaves. So they they start participating in a system and then Georgia becomes a, a slave state as well because, because of economic competition, if nothing else. Um, so it doesn't, there's all kinds of different religions, Presbyterian, um, Baptist, of course, the Church of England exists, but a lot of people don't do it in America because that's one of the reasons they left. One of the reasons that the Puritans come on the Mayflower um, to Massachusetts and land at Plymouth uh, in America. There's a place called Plymouth Rock you can visit where the, they landed. Um, one of the reasons they went there is because they were persecuted in England and they were not part of the, the Church of England. So um, this part of this benign neglect is that the Church of England doesn't control people's religious participation either. So there's freedom of religion and um, right away in the Declaration of Independence, another thing that in the Constitution, another thing that's important is that they they mention they mention God, um, but not as a as a, a reason for the leader to exist or be able to do something. Um, in in God we trust is what it says on the American coins. Um, those ideas were not present. It was supposed to be just like the French Revolution uh, and the Enlightenment period in European history. It was supposed to be reasonable. It was supposed to be rational. So the, the explanation for it had nothing to do with religion. And religion and politics should always be separate in America because, I mean, you saw, we talked about what, ha what happened when Henry VIII became um, the the head of the Church of England, uh, the church sort of got ransacked and he took advantage of it and made himself more powerful by getting money and by controlling people's lives religiously and um, politically. Uh, so they definitely don't want this. They don't want a king and they don't want a church which has the king as the head. So the Anglican church is never has a, a good foothold. All the other alternatives this, what they called in, in England dissenters, Methodists, um, Baptists, Puritans, Presbyterians, all of these groups, they, their um, contributions and their, their um, role in the colonies become um, very important. Like I said, Maryland, uh, Maryland is Catholic and ca being Catholic is illegal in, in England, but in America, you can go to Maryland and then you can practice um, your religion the way you want because Lord Calvert uh, was a Catholic who established that colony. So um, keep that in mind. Don't forget diversity in the colonies is a huge thing. One of the reasons why the British think that they can win the war, and we'll start next lecture talking about the end of the war and the consequences of the American Revolutionary War, um, which is also in the textbook, but they didn't expect all of these different colonies with all these different interests. They understood that they can get along in their own space, but they never expected them to form one country and get along 
and agree with each other because they had such different um, religious and political and cultural views um, of what what a state or what a colony should be like. But somehow they, they unified themselves through the effort of Benjamin Franklin and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and uh, Alexander Hamilton and John Hancock and a whole bunch of other people. Um, they had some amazing, they had a generation of very capable leaders who were willing to lead the revolution against uh, their home country uh, of Britain and they were successful. So we'll pick up there, uh, tie up some loose ends from the Revolutionary War and then go into, um, you know, the 75 years um, that leads up to the American Civil War. And we have to talk about industrialization in there too, which will, will include some British um, cultural references and discussion because they industrialized before America. Uh, but America, of course, does as well. Okay, so I'll see you again uh, next lecture. We have one more to do that's recorded, and then Friday is in person, remember. So uh, take care. See you. See you soon.